This is a special edition of Late Night Health. I'm Mark Allen. Our guest is Tamika Stewart. Uh, Tamika uh, is a seasoned strategic operations and development leader with over 17 years of experience in this, but uh, she's also a, a social worker. And her, her company works with small and large companies to help their employees be helpful. Would that be an accurate description, uh, Tamika? Yeah, I would say that's that's part of it. Definitely, I definitely help small. Most of my clients are small businesses, and that's really my, my target audience because historically they don't have access to some of the resources that your you know your Forbes and your Duponts and some of your other larger companies have access to. And the reality is, small businesses make up over ninety percent of you know the businesses in this country. And most people are employed by a small business. So with that, we have a huge group of people that aren't getting access to wellness programs or even talking about mental health, which is really important. Well, we have a pandemic right now, and you and I talked about this a little bit yesterday. It's, it's kind of driving me nuts because I'm isolated. Um, I'm a very social person personally, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I Zoom. Um, I've, I've Zoomed, I think, three times already today mm -hmm. and will probably do more later today. But it's just not the same as sitting down with friends or even uh, clients and talking to them face to face. Is there a mental aspect of this pandemic that is affecting people not only here in the U.S., but worldwide. Yes, it is. I mean, it's truly an understatement in terms of is there a mental, you know, a mental health pandemic happening. We've got the regular pandemic, and then we have the crisis of mental health right now. And it's interesting that you mentioned globally because, you know, some of the data that we're getting from Europe and other countries suggests that um, suicidality is going up, feelings of hopelessness is going up, and particularly here in the United States, you know, for entrepreneurs and small business owners, prior to the pandemic, and it was like maybe 45% of people were feeling stressed and maybe feel like their mental health wasn't as optimal as they'd like to. Fast forward to November of 2020, that went to 71%. So we've got, yeah, 71%. So it's a crisis at this point. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing such a push for schools to reopen because we've also seen an uptick in the, um, the number of children who are expressing thoughts of suicide. That jumped to 49% at the end of last year. Oh my. Yeah, and for women, yeah. So, and for women that jumped to 37%. So it's, it's a crisis right now. In, in you know, uh, with the rollout of, of the vaccine and uh, the hope, the, the light at the end of that very dark tunnel that we have been all living in. What can small businesses do? You know, may, maybe they have three or four employees. What can they do to help not only with the mental health, but wellness in general? Because that's what you also uh, work with. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we tell people to start with with our um, with our programs is to really normalize mental health and overall wellness, right? So make it comfortable for you to talk to your team about how you're feeling. That is the most important, the number one way really to get across to your team that you care about their wellness and you want them to prioritize it. That's the number one thing is, you know, take the elephant out of the room and ask point blank, how are you feeling? right? Not whether you have a cold or the sniffles, that's important too with our physical health, but how are you feeling emotionally? And really being able to have those tough conversations in a safe environment is important. Now, if you're a small business owner and everything that an employee tells you confidentially, you know, you're sharing with the next person, well, then, you know, you're not going to be successful. You know, it's about creating a safe space where it can be confidential, where you can talk to your people about how they're feeling and what's happening. That is the most important thing. And it doesn't matter how big the company is. I mean, if you've got, as I said, three or four people working for you or, or 20, that's still a small business, but you, you're, you're encouraging the owners or the bosses, the management to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations? 
not just what not just one on one conversations one on one conversations are important but it's also important to create a framework around wellness right so that means in your monthly meetings in your team huddles any opportunities that you have to meet with your with your team you want to create an opportunity for them to talk about wellness either it's through icebreakers through promotions through um, partnering with local wellness companies such as um, you know, we connected one of our clients to a Zumba organization. So you talk about, you know, during this pandemic and they created a wellness Wednesday where they did Zumba in the evenings and everyone got on Zoom and had a really great team building activity as well. So it's not just in one-on-one -on -one conversation, but it's creating that messaging that goes across all levels within your organization, that this is something that we prioritize. The, the what about things like uh, meditation? I'm uh, I'm noticing behind you you've got uh, some candles going, and um, uh, and it it just struck me that you probably meditate yourself. Do you teach meditation or suggest meditation as a form of of stress reduction? Yes, we do. Um, meditation and mindfulness has become much more of an accepted practice practice in Western, you know, in Western culture in the past five years. So we definitely encourage um, owners to incorporate that into their culture. So one of the things that we do is through icebreakers is starting each meeting with setting intention. And when you set the intention through a mindfulness activity, you can enhance creativity amongst your team you know, create that feeling of togetherness, even though we're all, you know, across the country or maybe even across the world, there, three minutes or less is really all you need to get the benefits of a mindfulness practice. Can you give us an example of, a, of an intention? I think that would be very beneficial. Something that, that, that you know, uh, I guess a general intention, you know, <laughs> please don't sure. take me. You know. So one of the things we do is ask people to, first of all, be mindful of their body when they're sitting in these Zoom meetings. You mentioned that you've been in three meetings. So with, you know, with that, it's very important to make sure that your feet are grounded. So first we ask people to make sure that both feet are grounded, they're not crossed. And then we ask you to start really becoming more mindful of your breath. So start taking a few deep breaths in through your nose and out slowly through your lips. You can close your eyes or you can keep them open, whatever you feel more comfortable with. And we ask you to do that a few more times. And while you're focusing on your breath, you're really trying to clear your head. If you wanna focus on a bird chirping outside, if you wanna focus on the clock ticking, just focus. Focus on something in the room that is not jarring. And just use that to relax and to think about what you have next planned for the rest of the day. So it's 10 o'clock your time. How do you want the rest of your morning to go? Set your intention. Think about your goals for the day. Imagine what completion looks like. Wow, that's very powerful. You need to be recording some audios. For your <laughs> right. It is. It can be helpful. Um, you know, we've introduced it to some of our clients in the school setting and to some of our clients in, who work in hospitals. It, it's very helpful, um, but it actually doesn't work for everyone. So I, I always encourage people not to explore, you know, one stop uh, cookie cutter, you know, resources. You want to do something that works for you. And if it doesn't work, that doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. Maybe there's just something else that you need to explore for your practice. There's there, you know, if you if working in schools where you might have uh, a bunch of teachers or administrators, um, but they're not together. They're, mm -hmm. you know, through Zoom or Skype or other uh, platforms that allow people to communicate. Can you do the 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 setting the intention and and being mindful uh, through technology? Does that work? Yes, it does. Um, we've been very fortunate with Zoom, Google Classroom, and other forms of technology to even create 
Zen dens, where you create these virtual spaces where teachers can go in and they can actually walk through a two minute mindfulness um, exercise, or they could listen to some jazz music, or we um, could help them talk through a difficult situation. So sometimes it means actually creating a space for teachers to be able to say, hey, look, uncle, you know, I've had enough, I need a break, and I need to really talk to someone. And the schools that really get it understand the need for having these programs in place, because utilizing your commercial insurance is just not going to give you what you need. You know, every, you know, the teachers at schools, they all have insurance. They're not accessing, you know, um, any mental health or wellness programs because they don't know about them. But when you're very intentional about what you do offer and create space during the school day for programs and for activities for teachers, that's when you start to see success. That's when you start to see teachers report feelings of support, engagement, and their productivity will go up. Stress is, is a killer. We know that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Being mindful, setting intentions, being cognizant of what's going on, I guess, not only in your personal life, but also in your work life. Do these help reduce that stress? It definitely can. So, it, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's up to the leader, the manager to normalize feelings of stress, normalize the fact that, hey, we're in the middle of a global pandemic and everything is not okay. But there's also a responsibility of the worker to say, look, if I'm not okay, I need to employ some new strategies so that I can improve my feelings of, of wellness. That includes in, you know, embracing an exercise program, enhancing diet, but making sure that the school or whoever, you know, all, any of our clients will have resources in place for them to do those things. When that happens, when there's that synergy there from both parties saying, hey, this is something that we need to actively work on as our action go actionable goals, then that's when we see improvement for sure. Have you noticed any difference between men and women in general? I mean, men, for example, uh, don't usually take care of their own health care, their spouse, girlfriend, wives, uh, significant other of, of uh, would say, hey, you haven't been to the doctor lately. I made an appointment, go. Uh, I, I don't know what the statistic is, but it's a lot. Uh, yeah. Most, you know, guys, we just like to take care of it ourselves. I think that I have noticed some gender differences. However, I think the most differences are based on age. So we'll have our Generation Z and our millennials, the guys are much more in tuned to having, you know, conversations about wellness and are more willing to uh, be proactive in scheduling appointments. However, as you start to go up the generational gap, you know, those Generation Xers like my um, self and then and our baby boomers, Yes, that's where we have to approach men a little bit more strategically. And we can't present it as a wellness program. Oftentimes we present it through sports or through, you know, through golf or through music or through other types of engagement activities to help promote wellness without them thinking about it intentionally, you know. Is there uh, any statistics that you're aware of to show uh, that stress and, and, and the suicide rate. I mean, this the first quarter of, of any year, apparently suicide rates do go up. Mm -hmm. You know, they've had the, the, the stress of the holidays and being with family, and there's a, a letdown of some kind mentally. Mm -hmm. And with the pandemic and with the aging of the population, with people not retiring as as early as they used to. Is there anything that you're aware of to show that, you know, uh, older people may be more susceptible to, uh, to suicide right now? Yes, actually there are. So what we have learned is particularly those 75 and older have seen a huge jump in suicidality in the past few years. So that was even before the pandemic started, but since it has started, it's definitely increased. And it makes sense when you think about it, 
the death toll. Most people at that age know someone who unfortunately has, has died from COVID at this point. There's a ton of isolation and loneliness. And, you know, we know that loneliness is highly correlated with heart disease, you know, depression, diabetes, all of those chronic illnesses that can shorten lifespan. So I think we've only tapped at the surface of the role of loneliness in an early death, particularly. And, and yeah, being lonely, I mean, we're all lonely, I'm lonely. I mean, you know, you're in Delaware, I'm in California. Um, uh, there used to be a time when you'd be in my studio. Yeah. Or I would come out to, to see you, and I'd love to do that. But it's, it's different right now because of the pandemic. Is that, that, that ray of light, the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel that I, I mentioned previously, are people hopeful? Are they grabbing onto that? Or are they going, oh no, just another... <sighs> you know, that's a good question. I think it's a combination of both. I think in order to be hopeful, we have to actively participate. And that means we're going to have good days and we're going to have bad days. I think when the pandemic first started, we didn't know what to expect. And I don't know about you, but I was on Zoom happy hours and I was doing everything via Zoom. And then it got to the point like in late summer where I didn't want to do Zoom as much anymore. You know, there were fewer Zoom family meetings and fewer Zoom game nights. So I think now we're at a place where there is hope because there is a vaccine that is available now. In some places, there are um, there's increased access to barbershops, restaurants, you know, although with some limitations, and some schools are even going hybrid. So those are the types of things that also can promote hope that we're going to get through this. But also, we have to make sure that we are exposing ourselves to things that make us feel well. You know, having a gratitude journal thinking about all the things that you are happy about, that you are grateful for right now, also can make the difference between someone who is feeling very um, overwhelmed about what's happening right now versus someone who has hope. So it's about really being intentional and making a decision to choose hope every day. It's, uh, we, we met yesterday uh, and, um... Uh, you, you're having some, we're having some work done and you were, you know, we were both in jeans and, and very, very casual. Right. To me, right. And then I, uh, I went uh, uh, here in California, uh, uh, hair salons and barbershops did open up this mm -hmm. week and I lost about, what would you say, two or three pounds of gas. Yes. <laughs> Minimum. Minimum. And, um, and I, I came back and I said to my wife, you know, Looking at the mirror, I feel better mm -hmm. myself. Are people not taking care of themselves during this pandemic? I mean, you know, you're, um, you're, the, the, my wife would say you're for puts. Do you, you know, you've got makeup on, you put lipstick on for this show, and, and we appreciate that. But does that make a person feel better? I mean, I know that when I get up in the morning, I know a lot of people come down in, 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 and working out of their house, they're in pajamas all day. Mm -hmm. And I can't do that. So I put on, I put on jeans. Um, if it's hot, I don't wear socks. But, you know, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it just makes me feel like I'm going to work. Right. You know, we definitely discourage wearing pajamas because wearing pajamas will decrease productivity and also could potentially increase feelings of sadness and that hopelessness that we were talking about. So again, it comes back to, if you want to choose hope, it's about creating a game plan. So what are the things I'm gonna do that I know make me feel better? And what we've learned is even if you are a business professional from the waist up and comfy cozy from the waist down, there's some benefits to that. So we encourage people to um, have, you know, embrace a business casual dress code at your office, encourage people to get dressed for work within reason, right? So that their productivity can go up and also it can enhance feelings of self-worth. You know, really being able to have that special spot that you go to for work and then when work is over, you know, leaving that spot 
and then you know ending it and and doing whatever it is that you do with at the end of the day to wind down and to calm down but it's definitely important to get ready for work even if you're working from home especially if you're working from home, especially if you're working from home. So again, you know, you can have on the comfy slippers and, you know, be comfortable, but from the waist up, we encourage you to definitely um, do your hair, you know, find a, a nice outfit for women, a nice shirt um, for men, a nice sweater, what you have on now, you know, you don't need to have a tie on necessarily, but to be comfortable, but professional, it does, imp it does impact productivity. It really does. All right. Personal question, Tamika. Are sure. you wearing bunny slippers now? They're not bunny, but they're definitely comfy. <laughs> okay. Just... I'm wearing comfy slippers. And it's also important to do things for yourself that can make your work environment fun. You know, definitely candles are highly correlated with sense of calm. You know, so getting some candles that have essential oils of, of lavender, of lemon, you know, those are all oils that are linked to uh, reducing stress is important. You know, let's also have some green plants. Green plants are helpful when you can't get outside, increasing the oxygen level in your home. And if you can, if you have the resources, you know, think about what it is that you like to do. Maybe it's that specialty coffee that you're going to invest in that you can brew in the morning. For me, I go to the local store and I buy like a $5 bunch of fresh flowers so I can have some, have, I have them up there. I say, oh yeah, every week, look at that. Every week I'll go and um, get some fresh flowers for $5 just to kind of make me feel better. So it's really personal in terms of thinking about well, what are the things that make me feel good that I can surround myself with and so I can be productive at work. Uh, our guest is Tamika Stewart. Uh, uh, you can find her at TamikaStewart.com. And she has TA THS Consulting is the name of the company, right? Mm -hmm. So she hasn't shared what the H stands for, but that's okay. <laughs> um, um, and you can find her at TamikaStewart.com. It's up on our screen right now as we're talking. Um, there's a word that we both used in the interview as we wrap up normalize mm. okay every now and then I'll say I want to go back to the way it was well mm. it's not going to is it and do we have to embrace the new normal yes we do I think part I'm of sorry. the I'm going to cry <laughs> <laughs> but you know what Mark part of the human experience is embracing the new normal, right? Aging is embracing the new normal. Going from different seasons and experiencing, you know, what happens when we go from cold to, cold to warm weather is embracing new normal. So I think that when we really, really look at it, being flexible and being nimble are all behaviors that we want to promote, regardless of what's happening, you know, in our culture and our environment. So. I think it's somewhat exciting because we've learned a lot about ourselves as well. We've learned that we can work remotely. We've learned that we can create meaningful relationships if we're not necessarily in the same room. Um, you know, parents have learned a great deal about multitasking. We've learned what our triggers are so that we can be more mindful of how to calm ourselves down. So I think that for every challenge that there's been, because there has been many, and I don't want to um, glamorize that because we've experienced a lot of loss, a lot of death, a lot of people are not working. So there are some real, real challenges that we have, we are facing, but with that, we are resilient and we were created to be resilient. And we, we are learning and evolving and, and gaining new skills and ways to cope every single day. We're going to be okay. Got it. We are, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, uh, we're going to do it together. Yes. How important is that? I mean, we can't, you know, the, the, the quote, no man is an island. Mm -hmm. I think Simon and Garfunkel also wrote about that uh, in in their music and we have to do this together as a group you know white black green purple left right up down we have to do this together mm -hmm. we have more in common than we have differences and that's really if we can focus on those things that we have in common 
then that will lead to so much more success in our families and our communities and, and even in our country, just focusing on the things that we have in common and letting that be our guide so we can get through this, this difficult time and, and be hopeful for what's ahead. Would you come back sometime? We have some... I would love to come back sometime, Mark. Maybe the, maybe next time I can actually come to L.A. <laughs> oh, I like that. That would be great. Yes. Uh, Tamika Stewart's been our guest here on Late Night Help, the special edition of, of the program. And we've been talking about reducing stress. Uh, if you're a small business, uh, a medium-sized business, or a big business, you really should check out Tamika's uh, website because there'll be some tips for you and perhaps you can um, uh, engage with Tamika to, to help your employees and yourself as the boss uh, reduce stress and, and live through this uh, pandemic. Tamika, stay safe. Uh, look forward to our next conversation. I really do. Thank you. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you for having me. Take care. My pleasure. Uh, I'm Mark Allen. This is Late Night Health. We'll be back very soon.